Hello everybody. How are we doing today? I'm gonna cut this down a little bit. Hi! It's Monday! Happy Monday! <laughs> I hope you guys are having a better Monday than I'm having. Um, but that was another reason I decided to stream because well num number one I'd scheduled it and number two I said this will improve my mood. I'm glad you're excited. Thank you all for being here. Um, it seems like the music might still be a slightly loud, so let me cut that down just another little smidgel it. All right. Yeah. I have uh, jury duty this week, and I had to go in, and I got dismissed for the rest of today and for tomorrow, but I have to serve in cases Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday unless they dismiss me, which is kind of a low possibility. <laughs> so, not looking forward to that, um, but, you know, it is what it is. So, anyway, um, I have a cup of peppermint tea, peppermint bark tea, so I think it's supposed to be a little sweeter. It's barely audible? Oh, okay. Let me cut it back up a little bit. Is that better? Um... Yeah, I want to make sure everything is as good as it can be. So you just let me know and I will adjust accordingly. Just saying hi, I'm still in book seven. That's fine, Heartless Room. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I don't really have any other reason to delay. Especially because the books get thicker from here and I still want to do them in three parts. So these parts are going to be much longer. For instance... My goal today is to read through chapter 5, which is 113 pages. So, I might be reading slightly fast. I will try not to read too fast. Uh, but 5 chapters is the goal today, 113 pages. So, I think I'm going to just jump right on in. Um, thank you. Um, okay. Whoop! I'm trying to split the difference between what I did. So. Thank you, Paige. I appreciate that. I think it's going to go up from here. I'm streaming. I'm with you with friends. I'm reading a book I love. Yeah. Catching up on YouTube is fun when there's no streams on. Yeah. And there's somebody usually always streaming, so... Okay, without further ado, I'm going to start by reading the back of the book. 
Dear Reader, Unless you are a slug, a sea anemone, or mildew, you probably prefer not to be damp. You might also prefer not to read this book, in which the Baudelaire siblings encounter an unpleasant amount of dampness as they descend into the depths of despair, underwater. In fact, the horrors they encounter are too numerous to list, and you wouldn't want me even to mention the worst of it, which includes mushrooms, a desperate search for something lost, a mechanical monster, a distressing message from a lost friend, and tap dancing. As a dedicated author who's pledged to keep recording the depressing story of the Baudelaire's, I must continue to delve deep into the cavernous depths of the orphans' lives. You, on the other hand, may delve into some happier book in order to keep your eyes and your spirits from being dampened. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Ew, dampness. Yeah. No, Tara, I don't think that's what anybody was wanting you to do. Okay. A Series of Unfortunate Events, Book the Eleventh, The Grim Grotto, by Lemony Snicket. For Beatrice, dead women tell no tales. Sad men write them down. Here's a picture, if you want to see the picture. My mug is still very warm. Yummy. Okay. Chapter 1. After a great deal of time examining oceans, investigating rainstorms, and staring very hard at several drinking fountains, the scientists of the world developed a theory regarding how water is distributed around our planet, which they have named the water cycle. The water cycle consists of three key phenomena, evaporation, precipitation, and collection, and all of them are equally boring. Of course, it is boring to read about boring things, but it is better to read something that makes you yawn with boredom than something that will make you weep uncontrollably, pound your fists against the floor, and leave tear stains all over your pillowcase, sheets, and boomerang collection. Like the water cycle, the tale of the Baudelaire children consists of three key phenomena, but rather than read their sorry tale, it would be best if you read something about the water cycle instead. Violet, the eldest phenomenon, was nearly 15 years old and very nearly the best inventor the world had ever seen. As far as I can tell, she was certainly the best inventor who had ever found herself trapped in the gray waters of the stricken stream, clinging desperately to a toboggan as she was carried away from the valley of four drafts. And if I were you, I would prefer to focus on the boring phenomenon of evaporation, which refers to the process of water turning into vapor and eventually forming clouds, rather than think about the turmoil that awaited her at the bottom of the Mortmain Mountains. Klaus was the second eldest of the Baudelaire siblings, but it would be better for your health if you concentrated on the boring phenomenon of precipitation, which refers to vapor turning back into water and falling as rain, rather than spending even one moment thinking about the phenomenon of Klaus's excellent skills as a researcher, and the amount of trouble and woe these skills would bring him once he and his siblings met up with Count Olaf, the notorious villain who'd been after the children ever since their parents had perished in a terrible fire. And even Sunny Baudelaire, who had recently passed out of babyhood, is a phenomenon all to herself, for only, not only for her very sharp teeth, which had helped the Baudelaires in a number of unpleasant circumstances, but also for her newfound skills as a cook, which had fed the Baudelaires in, an, in a number of unpleasant circumstances. Although the phenomenon of collection, which describes the gathering of fallen rain into one place so it can evaporate once more and begin the entire tedious process all over again, is probably the most boring phenomenon in the water cycle, it would be far better for you to get up and go right to your nearest library and spend several boring days reading every single boring fact you can find about collection, because the phenomenon of what happens to Sunny Baudelaire over the course of these pages is the most dreadful phenomenon that I could think of, and I can think of a great many. The water cycle may be a series of boring phenomena, but the story of the Baudelaire's is something else entirely, and this is an excellent opportunity to read something boring instead of learning what became of the Baudelaire's as the rushing waters of the stricken stream carried them away from the mountains. What will become of us? Violet asked, raising her voice to be heard over the rushing water. I don't think I can invent anything that can stop this toboggan. I don't think you should try. Klaus called back to his sister. The arrival of fall spring has thawed out the stream, but the waters are still very cold. If one of us fell into the stream, I'm not sure how long we could survive. Quigley, 
Sunny Wisp Win Sunny whimpered. The youngest Baudelaire often talked in a way that could be difficult to understand, but lately her speech had been developing almost as quickly as her cooking skills, and her siblings knew that Sunny was referring to Quigley Quagmire, with whom the Baudelaires had recently become friends. Quigley had helped Violet and Klaus reach the top of Mount Fraught in order to find the VFD headquarters and rescue Sunny from Count Olaf's clutches, but another tributary of the stricken stream had carried him off in the opposite direction, and the cartographer, a word which here means someone who is very good with maps and of whom Violet Baudelaire was particularly fond, didn't even have a toboggan to keep him out of the chilly water. I'm sure Quigley has gotten out of the water, Violet said quickly, although of course she knew, was sure of no such thing. I only wish that we knew where he was going. He told us to meet him somewhere, but the waterfall interrupted him. The toboggan bobbed in the water as Klaus reached into his pocket and drew out a dark blue notebook. The notebook had been a gift from Quigley, and Klaus was using it as a commonplace book, a, pr a phrase which here means a notebook in which he wrote any interesting or useful information. We decoded that message telling us about an important VFD gathering on Thursday, he said, and thanks to Sunny, we know that that meeting is at the Hotel Denouement. Maybe that's where Quigley wants to meet us, at the last safe place. But we don't know where that is, Violet pointed out. How can we meet someone in an unknown location? The three Baudelaire sighed, and for a few moments, the siblings sat quietly on the toboggan and listened to the gurgling of the stream. There are some people who like to watch a stream for hours, staring at the glittering water and thinking about the mysteries of the world. But the waters of the stricken stream were too dirty to glitter, and every mystery the children tried to solve seemed to reveal even more mysteries. And even those mysteries contained mysteries, so when they pondered these mysteries, they felt more overwhelmed than thoughtful. They knew that VFD was a secret organization, but they couldn't seem to find out much about what the organization did, or why it should concern the Baudelaire's. They knew that Count Olaf was very eager to get his filthy hands on a su certain sugar bowl, but they had no idea why the sugar bowl was so important, or where in the world it was. They knew that there were people in the world who could help them, but so many of these people, guardians, friends, bankers, had proven to be of no help at all or had just vanished from their lives when the Baudelaire's needed them most. And they knew there were people in the world who would not help them, villainous people, and their numbers seemed to be growing as their treachery and wickedness trickled all over the earth, like a dreadful water cycle of woe and despair. But right now, the biggest mystery seemed to be what to do next, and as the Baudelaire's huddled together on a floating toboggan, they could not think of a thing. If we stay on the toboggan, Violet said finally, where do you think we will go? Down the mountain, Klaus said. Water runs downhill. The stricken stream probably leads out of the Mortmain Mountains into the hinterlands, and then eventually it'll lead to a larger body of water, a lake or an ocean. From there, the water will evaporate into clouds, fall as rain and snow, and so on. Tedium, Sunny said. The water cycle is quite dull, Klaus agreed, but it might be the easiest way to get us away from Count Olaf. That's true, Violet said. Olaf said he'd be right behind us. Esmalita, Sunny said, which meant something like, along with Esme Squalor and Carmelita Spatz. And the Baudelaire's frowned as they thought of Olaf's girlfriend, who partic participated in Olaf's schemes because she believed that treachery and deception were very stylish, or in, and the former classmate of the Baudelaire's who had recently joined Olaf for selfish reasons of her own. So we're just going to sit on this toboggan, Violet asked, and see where it takes us? It's not much of a plan, Klaus admitted, but I cannot think of a better one. Passive, Sunny said, and her siblings nodded glumly. Passive is an unusual word to hear from a baby. And in fact, it's an unusual word to hear from a Baudelaire, or anyone else who leads an interesting life. It merely means accepting what is happening without doing anything about it. And certainly everyone has to have passive moments from time to time. Perhaps you've experienced a passive moment at the shoe store, where you sat in a chair as the shoe salesperson forced your feet into a series of ugly and uncomfortable shoes, while all the while what you wanted was a bright red pair with strange buckles that nobody on earth was going to buy for you. The Baudelaire's had experienced a passive moment at Briny Beach, where they had learned the terrible news about their parents, and had been numbly led by Mr. Poe toward their new unfortunate lives. I recently experienced a passive moment myself, sitting in a chair as a shoe salesperson forced my feet into a series of ugly and uncomfortable positions, while all the while I wanted a bright red pair of shoes with strange buckles that nobody on earth was going to buy for me. But a passive moment in the middle of a rushing stream, when villainous people are hot on your trail, 
is a difficult moment to accept, which is why the Baudelaire's fidgeted on the toboggan as the stricken stream carried them further and further downhill, just as I fidgeted as I tried to plan my escape from that sinister shoe emporium. Violet fidgeted and thought of Quigley, hoping he'd managed to escape from the cold water and get himself to safety. Klaus fidgeted and thought of VFD, hoping that he could still learn more about the organization even though their headquarters had been destroyed. And Sonny fidgeted and thought of the fish in the stricken stream, who would occasionally stick their heads out of the ashen water and cough. She was wondering if the ashes, which were left in the water by a recent fire in the mountains and made it difficult for the fish to breathe, would mean the fish would not taste very good, even if you used a recipe with plenty of butter or lemon. The Baudelaire's were so busy fidgeting and thinking that when the toboggan rounded one of the odd square sides of the mountain peaks, it was a moment before they noticed the view spread below them. Only when a few scraps of newspaper blew in front of their faces did the Baudelaire's look down and gasp at what they saw. What is it? Violet asked. I don't know, Klaus said. It's hard to tell from so high up. Subjevic? Sunny said, and she spoke the truth. From this side of the Mortmain Mountains, the Baudelaire's had expected to see the Hinterlands, a vast expanse of flat landscape where they had spent quite some time. Instead, it looked like the world had turned into a dark, dark sea. As far as the eye could see, there were swirls of gray and black, moving like strange eels in shadowy water. Every so often, one of the swirls would release a small, fragile object that would float up toward the Baudelaire's like a feather. Some of these objects were scraps of newspaper. Others appeared to be tiny bits of cloth, and some of them were so dark that they were utterly unrecognizable, a phrase Sonny preferred to express as subjevic. Klaus squinted down through his glasses and then turned to his sisters with a look of despair. I know what this is, he said quietly. It's the ruins of fire. The Baudelaire's looked down again and saw that Klaus was right. From such a height, it had taken the children a moment to realize that a great fire had raged through the hinterlands, leaving only ashen scraps behind. Of course, Violet said. It's strange we didn't recognize it before, but who would set fire to the hinterlands? We did, Klaus said. Caligari, Sonny said, reminding Violet of a terrible carnival in which the Baudelaire's had spent some time in disguise. Sadly, as part of their disguise, it had been necessary to assist Count Olaf in burning down the carnival, and now they could see the fruits of their labors, a phrase which here means the results of the terrible thing that they did, even though they did not mean to do it at all. The fire isn't our fault, Violet said. Not entirely. We had to help Olaf, otherwise he would have discovered our disguises. He discovered our disguises anyway, Klaus pointed out. No blame. Sonny said, which meant something like, but it's still not our fault. Sonny's right, Violet said. We didn't think of that plot. Olaf did. But we didn't stop him either, Klaus pointed out. And plenty of people think we're entirely responsible. These scraps of newspaper are probably from the Daily Punctilio, which has blamed us for all sorts of terrible crimes. You're right, Violet said with a sigh. Although I have since discovered that Klaus was wrong and that those scraps of paper blowing past the Baudelaire's were from another publication that would have been of enormous help had they stopped to collect those pieces. Maybe we should be passive for a while. Being active has not helped us much. In any case, Klaus said, we should stay on the toboggan. Fire can't hurt us if we're floating on a stream. It doesn't seem like we have a choice, Violet said. Look. The Baudelaire's looked and saw that the toboggan was approaching a sort of intersection where another tributary of the stricken stream was meeting up with theirs. The stream was now much wider and the water even rougher, so the Baudelaire's had to hang on tight in order not to be thrown into the deepening waters. We must be approaching a larger body of water, Klaus said. We're further along in the water cycle than I thought. Do you think that's the tributary that carried away Quigley? Violet said, craning her neck to look for her missing friend. Selfawa, Sunny cried, which meant we can't think about Quigley now, we have to think about ourselves. And the youngest Baudelaire was right. With a great whoosh, the stream turned another square corner, and within moments, the waters of the stream were churning so violently that it felt as if the Baudelaire's were riding a wild horse rather than a broken toboggan. Can you steer the toboggan toward the shore? Klaus yelled over the sound of the stream. No, Violet cried. The steering mechanism broke when we rode down the waterfall, and the stream's too wide to paddle there. Violet found a ribbon in her pocket and began to tie up her hair in order to think better. 
She gazed down at the toboggan and tried to think of various mechanical blueprints she had read in her childhood when her parents were alive and supportive of her interests in mechanical engineering. The runners of the toboggan, she said, and then repeated it in a shout to be heard over the water. The runners! They helped the toboggan maneuver on the snow, but maybe they could help us steer on the water. Where are the runners? Klaus asked, looking around. On the bottom of the toboggan, Violet cried. Impossiacto, Sunny asked, which meant something like, how can we get to the bottom of the toboggan? I don't know, Violet said and frantically checked her pockets for any inventing materials. She had been carrying a long bread knife, but it was now gone, probably carried away by the stream along with Quigley when she'd used it last. She looked straight ahead at the frothy rush of water threatening to engulf them. She gazed at the distant shores of the stream, which grew more and more distant as the stream continued to widen. And she looked at her siblings who were waiting for her inventing skills to save them. Her siblings looked back, and all three Baudelaire's looked at one another for a moment, blinking dark water out of their eyes as they tried to think of something to do. Just at that moment, however, one more eye arrived, also blinking dark water as it rose out of the stream, right in front of the Baudelaire's. At first it seemed to be the eye of some terrible sea creature, found only in books of mythology and the swimming pools of certain resorts. But as the toboggan took them closer, the children could see that the eye was made of metal, perched on top of a long metal pole that curved at the top so the eye could get a better look at them. It is very unusual to see a metal eye rising up out of the rushing waters of a stream, and yet this eye was something the Baudelaire's had seen many times since their first encounter with an eye tattoo on Count Olaf's left ankle. This eye was an insignia, and when you looked at it in a certain way, it also looked like three mysterious letters. VFD! Sunny cried as the toboggan drew even closer. What is that? Klaus asked. It's a periscope, Violet said. Submarines use them to look at things above the water. Does that mean, Klaus cried, there's a submarine beneath us? Violet did not have to answer because the eye rose further out of the water and the orphans could see that the pole was attached to a large, flat piece of metal, most of which was under the water. The toboggan drew closer until the periscope was in reach and then stopped, the way a raft will stop when it hits a large rock. Look, Violet cried as the stream rushed around them. She pointed to a hatch just at the bottom of the periscope. Let's knock, maybe they could hear us. We have no idea who's inside, Klaus said. Take cashins, Sunny shrieked, which meant, well, that's our only chance to travel safely through these waters. And she leaned down to the hatch and scraped at it with her teeth. Her siblings joined her, preferring to use their fists to pound on the metal hatch. Hello, Violet cried. Hello, Klaus yelled. Shalom, Sunny shrieked. Over the sound of the rushing stream, the Baudelaire's had heard a very dim sound coming from beneath the hatch. The sound was a human voice, very deep and echoey, as if it were coming from the bottom of a well. Friend or foe, it said. The Baudelaire's looked at one another. They knew, as I'm sure you know, that friend or foe is a traditional greeting directed at visitors who approach an important place, such as a royal palace or a fiercely guarded shoe store, and must identify themselves as either a friend or a foe of the people inside. But the siblings did not know if they were friends or foes for the simple reason that they had no idea who was talking. What should we say? Violet asked, lowering her voice. The eye might mean it's Count Olaf's submarine, in which case we're foes. But the eye could mean that it's VFD's submarine, uh, Klaus said, in which case we're friends. Obvio, Sunny said, which meant there's only one answer that'll get us into the submarine. And she called down to the hatch. Friend! There was a pause, and the echoey voice spoke again. Password, please, it said. The Baudelaire's looked at one another again. A password, of course, is a certain word or phrase that one utters in order to receive information or enter a secret place. And the siblings, of course, had no idea what they should say in order to enter a submarine. For a moment, none of the children said anything, merely tried to think, although they wished it were quieter so they could think without the distractions of the sounds of the rushing of water and the coughing of fish. They wished that instead of being stranded on a toboggan in the middle of the stricken stream, they were in some quiet room, such as the Baudelaire Library, where they could sit in silence and read up on the, what the password could be. But as the three siblings thought of one library, one sibling remembered another, the ruined VFD library, up in the Valley of Four Drafts where the headquarters had once stood. Violet thought of an iron archway, one of the few remnants of the library, and the motto that was etched into it. The eldest Baudelaire looked at her siblings and then leaned down the hatch and repeated those mysterious words she had seen, 
and that she hoped would bring her and her siblings to, fr to safety. The world is quiet here, she said. There was a pause, and with a loud metallic creak, the hatch opened, and the siblings peered into a dark hole, which had a ladder running along the side so they could climb down. They shivered, and not just from the icy chill of the mountain winds and the rushing dark waters of the stricken stream. They shivered because they did not know where they were going or who they might meet if they climbed down into the hole. Instead of entering, the Baudelaire's wanted to call something else down the hatch, the same words that had been called up to them. Friend or foe, they wanted to say. Friend or foe. Would it be safer to enter this submarine or safer to risk their lives outside in the rushing waters of the stricken stream? Enter, Baudelaire's, the voice said, and whether it belonged to friend or foe, the Baudelaire's decided to climb inside. That's the end of chapter one. What if I like sobbing uncontrollably? You would be in the minority. <laughs> it is overrated. I have hunger, you should eat. No, they, um, in the last couple books, um, they've kind of talked about the fact that Sunny's transitioned more into a toddler or young child. Um, cause her, she's speaking in a way that more people can understand. Um, she's walking, so I guess toddler. She's more toddler now. Let's switch books. And we have a piano in our house now. You got a CJ in the house. CJ's in the house. Passive moment. A crazy man at the library trying to tell me about something to do with the Hanna-Barbera company. Mosques and Arabs. It was unintelligible and made absolutely no sense. I was like, okay, that sounds like me at work some days. Is that how you got your piano? Aw, yay! I'm glad you got, um, the piano. CJ playing CJ. <laughs> I've always told CJ he should play us some music. The kids love fire. Maybe he's kiss yourself. Her missing friend, you mean your love, Violet? Yeah, that's basically what it means. Thank you, I try to make my whooshes very quality. <laughs> Shalom. Password one. She used a bread knife on Quigley? Yeah, probably. Thank you for the claps, Riddy, and hello. Fish cough. Yeah, because the, um, the fires in the area had gone into the stream, so the stream is full of ash, and it had been making the, the fish cough. LB boat to the face. Yes, hello, Reddy. Hope you're having a great day today. This is really good tea. Peppermint bark tea. I might take a break after like chapter two or three and make another cup of this because it's very good. Um, I think it's Republic of Tea. I buy a lot of Republic of Tea. Yeah, Koala Tea. Um, there's a world market um, just like walking distance of my house. So I go there a lot to buy tea because they're always mixing it up and they have a lot of international teas. But they stock a lot of Republic of Tea, and so I buy a lot of Republic of Tea from them. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on. Koala dabs. <laughs> Chapter 2. Right down here, the echoey voice said as the Baudelaire orphans began their journey down the ladder. Aye, mind the ladder. Close the hatch behind you. Don't rush. No, take your time. Don't fall. Mind your step. I don't trip. Don't make noise. Don't scare me. Don't look down. No, look where you're going. Don't bring any flammable liquids with you. Watch your feet. I. No, watch your back. No, watch your mouth. No, watch yourselves. I. I? Sunny whispered to her siblings. I, Klaus explained quietly, is another word for yes. I, the voice said below again. 
Keep your eyes open. Look out below. Look out above. Look out for spies. Look out for one another. Look out. I be very careful. Be very aware. Be very much. Take a break. No, no. Keep going. Uh, stay awake. Calm down. Cheer up. Keep climbing. Keep your shirt on. I. As desperate as their situation was, the Baudelaire's almost found themselves giggling. The voice was shouting out so many instructions and so few of them made any sense that it would have been impossible for the children to follow them all. And the voice was quite cheerful and a bit scattered, as if whoever was talking did not really care if their instructions were followed and had probably forgotten all of them already. Hold on to the railing, the voice continued as the Baudelaire spotted a light at the end of the passageway. Aye, no, hold on to yourselves, no, hold on to your hats, no, hold on to your hands, no, hold on, wait a minute, wait a second, oh, stop waiting, stop war, stop injustice, stop bothering me, aye. Sunny had been the first to enter the passageway, and so she was the first to reach the bottom and lower herself carefully into a small dim room with a very low ceiling. Standing in the center of the room was an enormous man, dressed in a shiny suit made of some sort of slippery-looking material with equally slippery-looking boots on his feet. On the front of the suit was a portrait of a man with a beard, although the man himself had no beard, merely a very long mustache curled up at both ends like a pair of parentheses. One of you is a baby, he cried as Klaus and Violet lowered themselves next to their sister. I, no, both of you are babies. No, there's three of you. No, well, none of you are babies. Well, one of you sort of is a baby. Welcome. I, hello, good afternoon, howdy, shake my hand, I. The Baudelaire's hurriedly shook the man's hand, which was covered in a glove made of the same slippery material. My name is Violet Bo- Violet started to say, Baudelaire, the man interrupted. I know, I'm not stupid. I and your Klaus and Sonny, you're the Baudelaire's, the three Baudelaire children. I, the ones the daily punctilio blames for every crime they can think of, but you're really innocent, but nevertheless in a big heap of trouble. Of course, nice to meet you in person, so to speak. Let's go, follow me, I- the man whirled around and stomped out of the room, leaving the bewildered Baudelaire's little else to do but follow him down the corridor. The corridor was covered in metal pipes that ran along the walls, floor, and ceiling, so the Baudelaire's sometimes had to duck or step very high in order to make their way. Occasionally, drops of water would drip from one of the pipes and land on their heads, but they were already so damp from the stricken stream that they scarcely noticed. Besides, they were too, far too busy trying to follow what the man was saying to think of anything else. Let's see, I'll put you to work right away. I, oh, uh, no, no, first I'll give you a tour. No, I'll give you lunch. No, I'll introduce you to my crew. No, I'll let you rest. No, I'd better get you into uniforms. I, it's important that everyone aboard wear a waterproof uniform in case the submarine collapses and we find ourselves underwater. Of course, in that case, we'll need diving helmets. Except Sunny, because she can't wear one. I guess she'll drown. No, she can curl up inside a diving helmet. I, the helmets have a tiny door on the neck just for such a purpose. I have seen it done. I've seen it so many things in my time. Excuse me, Violet said. Could you tell us who you are? The man whirled around to face the children and held his hands up over his head. What? He roared. You don't know who I am? I've never been so insulted in my life. No, I have. Many times, in fact. I, I remember when Count Olaf turned to me and said in that horrible voice of his. No, never mind, I'll tell you. I'm Captain Widdershins. That's spelled W-I-D-D-E-R-S-H-I-N-S. -D -D -E backwards, it's S-N-I-H-S-R. Well, never mind. Nobody spells it backward, except people who have no respect for the alphabet. And they're not here, are they? No, Klaus said. We have a great deal of respect for the alphabet. I should say so, the captain cried. Klaus Baudelaire, disrespect the alphabet? Why, it's unthinkable. Aye, it's illegal. It's impossible. It's not true. How dare you say so? No, you didn't say so. I apologize. One thousand pardons, I. Is this your submarine, Captain Wittershins? Violet asked. What? The captain roared. You don't know whose submarine this is? A renowned inve inventor like yourself, and you haven't the faintest, faintest sense of basic submarine history. Of course this is my submarine. It's been my submarine for years. Aye. Have you never heard of Captain Wittershins and the Queequeg? Have you never heard of the submarine Q and its crew of two? That's a little nickname I made up myself with a little help. I, I would think Josephine would have told you about the Queequeg. After all, I patrolled Lake Lacrimos for years. Poor Josephine. There's not a day I don't think of her. I, except some days when it slips my mind. No tootie? Sonny asked. I was told it would take me some time to understand everything you said, the captain said, looking down at Sonny. I'm not sure I'll find the time to learn another foreign language. 
eye. Perhaps I should enroll in some night classes. What my sister means, Violet said quickly, is that she's curious how you know so much about us. How does anyone know anything about anything? The captain replied. I read it, of course. I, I've read every volunteer factual dispatch I've received. Although lately I haven't received any. I, that's why I'm glad you happened along. I, I thought I might faint when I peered through the terrace periscope and saw your damp little faces staring back at me. I, I was sure it was you, but I didn't hesitate to ask you the password. I, I never hesitate. I, that's my personal philosophy. The captain stopped in the middle of the hallway and pointed to a brass rectangle that was attached to the wall. It was a plaque, a word which here means metal rectangle with words carved on it, usually to indicate that something important has happened on the spot where the rectangle is attached. This plaque had a large VFD eye carved at the top, watching over the words, the captain's personal philosophy, carved in enormous letters, but the Baudelaire's had to lean in close to see what was printed beneath it. He who hesitates is lost, the captain cried, pointing at each word with a thick gloved finger. Or she, Violet added, pointing to a pair of words that someone had added in scratchy handwriting. My stepdaughter added, th added that, Captain Wittershin said, and she's right. Or she. One day I was walking down this very hallway and I realized that anyone can be lost if they hesitate. A giant octopus could be chasing you, and if you decided to pause for a moment and tie your shoes, what would happen? All would be lost, that's what would happen. Aye, that's why it's my personal philosophy. I never hesitate. Never. Aye. Well, sometimes I do, but I try not to, because he or she who hesitates is lost. Let's go. Without hesitating a moment longer at the plaque, Captain Wittershins whirled around and led the children further down the corridor, which echoed with the odd sound of his waterproof boots each time he took a step. The children were a bit dizzy from the captain's chatter, and they were thinking about his personal philosophy and whether or not it ought to be their personal philosophies as well. Having a personal philosophy is like having a pet marmoset, because it may be very attractive when you acquire it, but there may be situations when it will not be in be when it will not come in handy at all. He or she who hesitates is lost sounded like a reasonable philosophy at first glance, but the Baudelaire's could think of situations in which hesitating might be the best thing to do. Violet was glad she'd hesitated when she and her siblings were living with Aunt Josephine, otherwise she might never have realized the importance of the peppermint she found in her pocket. Klaus was glad he'd hesitated at, Heim at Heimlich Hospital, otherwise he might never have thought of a way to disguise Sonny and himself as medical professionals so they could rescue Violet from having unnecessary surgery. And Sonny was glad she'd hesitated outside Count Olaf's tent on Mount Fraud, otherwise she might have never overheard the name of the last safe place, which the Baudelaire still hoped to reach. But despite all these incidents in which hesitation had been very helpful, the children did not wish to adopt he or she who does not hesitate is lost as their personal philosophy because a giant octopus might come along at any moment, particularly when the Baudelaire's were on board a submarine and the siblings would be very foolish to hesitate if the octopus were coming after them. Perhaps, the Baudelaire's thought, the wisest personal philosophy concerning hesitation would be sometimes he or she should hesitate and sometimes he or she should not hesitate, but this seemed far too long and vague to be much use on a plaque. Maybe if I hadn't hesitated, the captain continued, the Queequeg would have been repaired by now. Aye, the submarine Q and its crew of two is not in the best of shape, I'm afraid. Aye, we've been attacked by villains and leeches, by sharks and realtors, by pirates and girlfriends, by torpedoes and angry salmon. Aye, he stopped at a thick metal door, turned to the Baudelaire's inside. Everything from the radar mechanisms to my alarm clock is malfunctioning. Aye, that's why I'm glad you're here, Violet Baudelaire. We're desperate for someone with mechanical smarts. I'll see what I can do, Violet said. Well, take a look, Captain Wittershins cried and swung open the door. The Baudelaire's followed him into an enormous cavernous room that echoed when the captain spoke. They were pipes on the ceiling, pipes on the floor, and pipes sticking out of the walls at all angles. Between the pipes was a bewildering array of panels with knobs, gears, and tiny screens, as well as tiny signs saying things like, Danger! Warning! And he or she who hesitates is lost! Here and there were a few, a few green lights, and at the far end was an enormous wooden table, piled with books, maps, and dirty dishes, which stood beneath an enormous porthole, a word which here means round window through which the Baudelaire's could see the filthy waters of the stricken stream. This is the belly of the beast, the captain said. 
Aye, it's the center of all operations aboard the Queequeg. This is where we control the submarine, eat our meals, research our missions, and play board games when we're tired of working. He strode over to one panel and ducked his head beneath it. Fiona, he called, come out of there. There was a faint rattling sound, and then the children saw something race out from under the panel and halfway across the floor. In the dim green light, it took a moment to see it was a girl a bit older than Violet, who was lying face up on a small wheeled platform. She was wearing a suit just like Captain Wittershins, with the same portrait of the bearded man on the front, and had a flashlight in one hand and a pair of pliers on the other. Smiling, she handed the pliers to her stepfather, who helped her up from the platform as she put on a pair of eyeglasses with triangular frames. Baudelaire's, the captain said. This is Fiona, my stepdaughter. Fiona, this is Violet, Klaus, and Sonny Baudelaire. Charmed, she said, extending a gloved hand first to Violet, then to Klaus, and finally to Sonny, who gave Fiona a big toothy smile. I'm sorry I wasn't... I'm sorry I wasn't... So up much to celebrate two years sub and just got married. <clears throat> I'm sorry I wasn't upstairs to meet you. I've been trying to repair this telegram device, but electrical repair work is not my specialty. I, the captain said, for quite some time we've stopped receiving telegrams, but Fiona can't seem to make heads or tails of the device. Violet, get to work! You'll have to forgive the way my stepfather speaks, Fiona said, putting an arm around him. It can take some getting used to. We don't have time to get used to anything, Captain Wittershins cried. This is no time to be passive. He who hesitates is lost. Or, or she, Fiona corrected quietly. Come on, Violet, I'll get you a uniform. If you're wondering whose portrait's on the front, it's Herman Melville. He's one of my favorite authors, Klaus said. I really enjoy the way he dramatizes the plight of overlooked people, such as poor sailors or exploited youngsters, though his strange, often experimental, through his strange, often experimental, philosophical prose. Philosophical prose. I should have known you'd liked him. Uh, Fiona replied. When Josephine's house fell into the lake, my stepfather and I managed to save some of her library before it became too soaked. I read some of your decoding notes, Klaus. You're a very perceptive researcher. It's very kind of you to say so, Klaus said. Aye, the captain cried. A perceptive researcher is just what we need. He stomped over to the table and lifted a pile of papers. A certain taxi driver managed to smuggle these charts to me, he said, but I can't make heads or tail of them. They're confusing. They're confounding. The conversational... Uh, uh, no, that's not what I meant. I think you mean convoluted, Klaus said, peering at the charts. Conversational means having to do with conversation, but convoluted means complicated. What kind of charts are they? Tidal charts, the captain cried. We have to figure out the exact course of the predominant tides at the point where the stricken stream meets the sea. Klaus, I want you to find a uniform and get to work immediately. I, I, Klaus said, trying to get into the spirit of the Queequeg. I, the captain cr answered in a happy roar. I, Sonny asked. I, the captain said. I haven't forgotten you, Sonny. I'd never forget, Sonny, not in a million years. Not that I will live that long, particularly because I don't exercise very much. But I don't like exercising, so it's worth it. Why, I remember when they wouldn't let me go mountain climbing because I hadn't trained properly, and perhaps you should tell Sonny what you have in mind for her to do? Fiona said gently. Of course, the captain cried. Naturally. Our other crewman has been in charge of cooking, but all he does is make these terrible, damp casseroles. I'm tired of them. I'm hoping your cooking skills might improve our meal situation. Sue, Sunny said modestly, which meant something like, Well, I haven't been cooking for very long. And her siblings were quick to translate. Well, we're in a hurry, the captain replied, walking over to a far door marked kitchen. We can't wait for Sunny to become an expert, expert chef before getting to work. He or she who hesitates is lost. He opened the door and called inside. Cookie, get out here and meet the Baudelaire's. The children heard some quiet, uneven footsteps, as if the cook had something wrong with one leg, and then a man limped through the door, wearing the same uniform as the captain and a wide smile on his face. Baudelaire's, he said. I always believed I'd see you again some day. The three siblings looked at this man, and then lo looked at one another in stupefaction, a word which here means amazement at seeing a man for the first time since their stay at Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, when his kindness toward them had been one of the few positive aspects of that otherwise miserable chapter in their lives. Phil, Violet cried, what on earth are you doing here? He's the second of our crew of two, the captain cried. 
I, the original second in the crew of two, was Fiona's mother, but she died in a manatee accident quite a few years ago. I'm not so sure it was an accident, Fiona said. Then we had Jacques, the captain continued. I, and then, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jacques's brother, and then a dreadful woman who turned out to be a spy. And finally, we have Phil, although I like to call him Cookie. I don't know why. I was tired of working in the lumber industry, Phil said. I was sure I could find a better job, and look at me now! Cook on a dilapidated submarine. Life keeps on getting better and better. You always were an optimist, Klaus said. We don't need an optimist, Captain Wittershin said. We need a cook. Get to work, Baudelaire's all of you. I. we have no time to waste. He who hesitates is lost. Or she, Fiona reminded her stepfather. And do we really have to start right this minute? I'm sure the Baudelaire's are exhausted from their journey. We could spend a nice quiet evening playing board games. Board games? The captain said in astonishment. Amusements? Entertainments? We don't have time for such things. Aye, today's Saturday, which means we only have five days left. Thursday's the VFD gathering, and I don't want anyone at the Hotel Denouement to say that the Queequeg has not performed its mission. Mission? Sonny asked. Aye, Captain Wittershin said. We mustn't hesitate. We must act. We must hurry. We must move. We must search. We must investigate. We must hunt. We must pursue. We must stop occasionally for a brief snack. We must find that sugar bowl before Count Olaf does. Aye. That's the end of chapter two. I have a lot to catch up on. Give me just a moment. Number one, uh, thank you so much for the resub, Moocher, and congrats on the wedding! I hope everything was perfect and beautiful. I hope you guys are doing well. If you're going on honeymoon or anything like that, I hope you guys are being safe. Is it the guy from the library? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, the- from your library story? He who hesitates is octopus bait. Women aren't octopus bait. <laughs> Hi, Rock. How are you doing? <laughs> Hesitation is subject to situations. That's good. That's a good one. Pipes on the ceiling. Pipes on the floor. Pipes in the windows. Pipe, pipe, pipes galore. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's a reference, but it was funny. Hope you enjoyed Super Mario Bros. 2. As long as there are no pipes on the rooftop. No pipes on me! I hope you're doing well, Moocher. Hey, Ka, how's it going? It was a long weekend, but that'll happen. Hope your weekend was good to you. Good. Oh, yeah, gotcha. Best weekend ever. Booked a boarding school so all 80 people could sleep there without booking a hotel room. That's awesome! That's a really smart idea! And I suppose since they're out for the summer, that makes sense. Get some your- get some of those refreshments. Hey, Mystic! How's it going? I had booked a, I remember you had told me about booking that band as a surprise. They even made fun with now the groom would teach line dance while they played Achy Breaky Heart. Ha, that was so funny. Oh, I'm so glad. Did your bride like it? I know you'd said that it, she really loved that band. Thank you for the claps. I don't think it was a reference. I'm doing pretty good. Kind of a down day, but I'm feeling much better now. Alright, so this is probably going to be a kind of a long stream. I'm 52 minutes in and I've only done two of the five chapters. That's amazing, Moocher. I'm so glad. Okay, I'm going to keep pressing on because I don't want this chat or this stream to go on forever and ever and ever. So I'm going to keep going. But thank you to everybody who's here. Hope you're all doing well. Thank you all for being here. Hope you're having a good day. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 3. The expression, Shiver Me Timbers, comes from the Society of Pirates. 
who enjoy using interesting expressions almost as much as jumping aboard other people's ships and stealing their valuables. It's an expression of extreme amazement, used in circumstances when one feels as if one one's very bones or timbers are shivering. I have not used the expression since one rainy night when it was necessary to pose as a pirate experiencing amazement. But when Captain Wittershins told the Baudelaire orphans where the Queequeg was going and what it was searching for, there was a perfect opportunity to utter those words. Shiver me timbers, Sonny cried. Your timbers, the captain cried back. Are the Baudelaire's practicing piracy? Aye, my heavens, if your parents knew that you were stealing the treasures of others. We're not pirates, Captain Wittershins, Violet said hastily. Sonny's just using an expression she learned from an old movie. She just means we're surprised. Surprised? The captain paced up and down in front of them, his waterproof suit crinkling with every step. Do you think the Queequeg made its difficult way up the stricken stream just for my own personal amusement? I? Do you think I would risk such terrible danger simply because I had no other plans for the afternoon? I? Do you think it was crazy coincidence that you ran into our periscope? I? Do you think this uniform makes me look fat? I? Do you think members of VFD would just sit and twiddle their thumbs while Count Olaf's treachery covers the land like crust covers the filling of a pie? I? You were looking for us? Klaus asked in amazement. He was tempted to cry shiver me timbers like his sister, but he did not want to alarm Captain Wittershins any further. For you, the captain cried. I. For the sugar bowl, I. For justice, I. And liberty, I. For an opportunity to make the world quiet, I. And safe, I. And we may only have until Thursday, I. And we're in terrible danger, I. So get to work. Bamboozle, Sonny cried. My sister's confused, Violet said. And so are we, Captain Wittershins. If we could just stop for just a moment and hear your story from the beginning. Stop for a moment? The captain repeated in astonishment. I've just explained our desperate circumstances and you're asking me to hesitate. My dear girl, remember my personal philosophy. I, he or she who hesitates is lost. Now let's get moving. The children looked at one another in frustration. <laughs> they did not want to get moving. It felt to the Baudelaire orphans that they had been moving almost constantly since that terrible day at the beach when their lives had been turned upside down. They had moved into, into Count Olaf's home, and then into the homes of various guardians. They had moved away from a village intent on burning them at the stake, and they had moved into a hospital that had burst into flames around them. They had moved to the hinterlands in the trunk of Count Olaf's car, and they had moved away from the hinterlands in disguise. They had moved up the Mortmain Mountains hoping to find one of their parents, and they had moved down the Mortmain Mountains again. And now in a tiny submarine in the stricken stream, they wanted to stop moving just for a little while and receive some answers to questions they had been asking themselves since all this moving had begun. Stepfather, Vi Vi Fiona said quickly, Why don't you start up the Queequeg's engines and I'll show the Baudelaire's where our spare uniforms are. I'm the captain, the captain announced. I, I'll give the orders around here. Then he shrugged and squinted up toward the ceiling. The Baudelaire's noticed for the first time a ladder of rope running up the side of wall. It led up to a s small shelf where the children could see a large wheel, probably for steering, and a few rusty levers and switches that were Byzantine in their design, a phrase which here means so complicated that perhaps even Violet Baudelaire would have trouble working them. I order myself to go up the ladder, the captain continued a bit sheepishly, and start the engines of the Queequeg. With one last eye, the captain began hoisting himself toward the ceiling, and the Baudelaire's were left alone with Fiona and Phil. You must be overwhelmed, Baudelaire's, Phil said. I remember my first day aboard the Queequeg. It made Lucky Smell's lumber mill seem calm and quiet. Phil, why don't you get the Baudelaire's some soda while I find them some uniforms, Fiona said. Soda? Phil said with a nervous glance at the captain who was already halfway up the ladder. We're supposed to save the soda for a special occasion. It is a special occasion, Fiona said. We're welcoming three more volunteers on board. What kind of soda do you prefer, Baudelaire? Anything but parsley, Violet said, referring to a beverage enjoyed by Esme Squalor. <clears throat> I'll bring you some lemon lime, Phil said. Sailors should always make sure there's plenty of citrus in their system. I'm so glad to see you, children. You know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. 
I was so horrified after what happened in Poultryville that I couldn't stay at Lucky Smells, and since then my life has been one big adventure. I'm sorry that your leg never healed, Klaus said, referring to Phil's limp. I didn't realize the accident with the stamping machine was so serious. Oh, that's not why I'm limping, Phil said. I was bitten by a shark last week. It was very painful, but I'm quite lucky. Most people never get an opportunity to get so close to such an incredible deadly animal. The Baudelaire's watched him as he limped back through the kitchen tor door, whistling a bouncy tune. Was Phil always optimistic when you knew him? Fiona asked. Always, Violet said, and her siblings nodded in agreement. We've never known anyone who could remain so cheerful, no matter what terrible things occurred. To tell you the truth, I sometimes find it a bit tiresome, Fiona said, adjusting her triangular glasses. Shall we find you some uniforms? The Baudelaire's nodded and followed Fiona out of the main hall and back into the narrow corridor. I know you have a lot of questions, she said, so I'll try to tell you everything I know. My stepfather believes that he or she who hesitates is lost, but I have a more cautious personal philosophy. We'd be very grateful if you might tell us a few things, Klaus said. First, how do you know who we are? Why were you looking for us, and how did you know where to find us? That's a lot of firsts, Fiona said with a smile. I think you Baudelaire's are forgetting that your exploits haven't exactly been a secret. Nearly every day there's been a story about you in one of the most popular newspapers. The Daily Punctilio? Violet asked. I hope you haven't been believing those dreadful lies they've been printing about us. Of course not, Violet... Fiona said. But even the most ridiculous of stories can contain a grain of truth. The Daily Punctilio said you'd murdered a man in the village of Foul Devotees and then set fires at Heimlich Hospital and Caligari Carnival. We knew, of course, you hadn't committed these crimes, but we could tell you'd been there. My stepfather and I figured you'd found the secret stain on Madame Lulu's map and were headed for the VFD headquarters. Klaus gasped. You know about Madame Lulu, he said, and the coded stain? My stepfather taught that code to Madame Lulu, Fiona explained, a long time ago, when they were both young. Well, we heard about the destruction of the headquarters, so we assumed you'd be heading back down the mountain. So I set a course for the Queequeg to journey up the stricken stream. You traveled all the way up here, Klaus said, just to find us? Fiona looked down. Well, no, she said. You weren't the only thing at VFD headquarters. One of our volunteer factual dispatches told us that the Sugar Bowl was there as well. Deaf and fat? Sunny asked. What are volunteer factual dispatches exactly? Violet translated. They're a way of sharing information, Fiona said. It's difficult for volunteers to meet up with one another, so when they unlock a mystery, they can write it in a telegram. That way, important information gets circulated, and before long, our commonplace books will be full of information we can use to defeat our enemies. A commonplace book is a... We know what a commonplace book is, Klaus said, and removed his dark blue notebook from his pocket. I've been keeping one myself. Fiona smiled and drummed her gloved fingers on the cover of Klaus's book. I should have known, she said. If your sisters want to start books themselves, we should have a few spares. Everything's in our supply room. So are we going up to the ruins of the headquarters, Violet asked, to get the sugar bowl? We didn't see it there. We think someone threw it out the window, Fiona answered, when the fire began. If they threw the sugar bowl from the kitchen, it would have landed in the stricken stream and been carried by the water cycle all the way down the mountains. We were seeing if it, it could be found at the bottom of the stream when we happened upon you three. The stream probably carried it much further than this. Klaus said thoughtfully. I think so too, Fiona agreed. I'm hoping you can discover its location by studying my stepfather's title charts. I can't make head or tail of them. I'll show you how to read them, Klaus said. It's not that difficult. That's what frightens me, Fiona said. If those charts aren't difficult to read, then Count Olaf might have a chance of finding the sugar bowl before we do. My stepfather says that if the sugar bowl falls into his hands, then all of the efforts of all the volunteers will be for naught. The Baudelaire Baudelaire's no the Baudelaire's nodded, and the four children made their way down the corridor in silence. The phrase for naught is simply a fancy way of saying for nothing, and it doesn't matter which phrase you use, for they are both equally difficult to admit. Later this afternoon, for instance, I will enter a large room full of sand, and if I do not find the test tube I am looking for, it will be difficult to admit that I have sifted through all of that sand for nothing. If you insist on finishing this book, you will find it difficult to admit, between bouts of weeping, that you have read this story for naught, and that it would have been better to page through tedious descriptions of the water cycle. And the Baudelaire's did not want to find themselves admitting that all of their troubles had been for naught, and that all of their adventures meant nothing, 
and that if their entire lives were not and nothing, if Count Olaf managed to find this crucial sugar bowl before they did. The three siblings followed the three siblings followed Fiona down the dim corridor and hoped that their time aboard the Queequeg would not be another terrifying journey ending in more disappointment, disillusionment, and despair. For the moment, however, their journey ended at a small door where Fiona stopped and turned to face the Baudelaire's. This is our supply room, she said. Inside you'll find uniforms for the three of you, although even our smallest size might be too big for Sunny. Pinstripe, Sunny said. She meant something like, don't worry, I'm used to ill-fitting clothing and her siblings were quick to translate. You'll need diving helmets too, Fiona said. This is an old submarine and it could spring a leak. If the leak is serious, the pressure of the water could cause the walls of the Queequeg to collapse, filling all these rooms and corridors with water. The oxygen systems contained in the diving helmets enable you to breathe underwater, for a short time anyway. Your stepfather said that the helmets would be too big for Sunny and she'd have to curl up inside one, Violet said. Is that safe? Safe but uncomfortable. Fiona said, like everything else on the Queequeg. This submarine used to be in wonderful shape, but without anyone who knows about mechanics, it's not quite up to its former glory. Many of the rooms have flooded, so I'm sorry to say that we'll be sleeping in very tight quarters. I hope you like bunk beds. We've slept on worse, Klaus said. So I hear, Fiona replied. I read a description of the orphan shack at Proofrock Preparatory School. That sounded terrible. So you knew about us even then? Violet asked. Why didn't you find us sooner? Fiona sighed. We knew about you, she said. Every day I would read terrible stories in the newspaper, but my stepfather said we couldn't do anything about all the treachery those stories contained. Why not? Klaus asked. He said your troubles were too enormous, she replied. I don't understand, Violet said. I don't really understand either, Fiona admitted. My stepfather said that the amount of treachery in this world is enormous, and that the best we could do was one small noble thing. That's why we're looking for the sugar bowl. You'd think that accomplishing such a small task would be easy, but we've been looking for ages and we still haven't found it. But what's so important about the sugar bowl? Klaus asked. Fiona sighed again and blinked several times behind her triangular glasses. She looked so sad that the middle Baudelaire almost wished he hadn't asked. I don't know, she said. He will not tell me. Why no? Sonny asked. He said it was better I didn't know, Fiona said. I guess that's enormous too, an enormous secret. He said people had been destroyed for knowing such enormous secrets and that he didn't want me in that sort of danger. But you're already in danger, Klaus said. We're all in danger. We're on board an unstable submarine, trying to find a tiny important object before a nefarious villain gets his hands on it. Fiona turned the handle of the door, which opened with a long, loud creak that made the Baudelaire shiver. The room was very small and very dim, lit by only one small green light, and for a moment it looked like the room was full of people staring silently at the children in the corridor. But then the siblings saw it was just a row of uniforms hanging limply from hooks along the wall. I guess there are worse dangers, Fiona said quietly. I guess there are dangers we simply can't imagine. The Baudelaire's looked at their companion and then at the new, at the eerie row of empty uniforms. On a shelf above the waterproof suits was a row of large diving helmets, round spheres of metal with small circular windows in the middle so the children would be able to see out when they put them on. In the dim green light, the helmets looked a bit like eyes, glaring at the Baudelaire's from the supply room just as the eye on Count Olaf's ankle had glared at them so many times before. Although they still weren't pirates, the siblings were tempted to say shiver me timbers once again as they stepped inside the small cramped room and felt themselves shiver down to their bones. They did not like to think about the Queequeg springing a leak or collapsing or to imagine themselves frantically attaching the diving helmets to their heads, or in Sunny's case, frantically stuffing herself inside. They did not like to think about where Count Olaf might be or imagine what would happen if he found the sugar bowl before they did. But most of all, the Baudelaire orphans did not like to think about the dangers Fiona had mentioned, dangers worse than the ones they faced, or dangers they simply couldn't imagine. End of chapter three. Oh, be safe driving, Reddy. You're probably not here, but welcome for not having the stream go on forever and ever and ever. Boo has stolen my blanket. 
I could not read forever and ever and ever. My voice would just give out. Boo stole the blanket so Boo can be a ghost and scare. Are they still harping on that day on the beach? What is my favorite game? I think my favorite game of all time is probably Pokemon Emerald. Um, other favorite games of all time are going to be Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, Nancy Drew, Secret of Shadow Ranch, um, Animal Crossing. Um, I don't know. I love a lot of games. Lemon Lime Poggers. Hey, E. This is not Splatoon Monday. I haven't played Splatoon in so long. I haven't really been feeling Splatoon-y. I'm glad you're feeling peppy today, E. I keep imagining the Queequeg is called Cray Cray because I listen poorly. <laughs> Thank you for the clapping. Eating cookies from China. <gasps> yeah, I thought about playing for the final Splatfest, but I just didn't. I will be getting the new Animal Crossing. I'm very excited about it. Okay. <clears throat> Moving along. Chapter 4. The expression fits like a glove is an odd one because there are many different types of gloves and only a few of them are going to fit the situation you're in. If you need to keep your hands warm in a cold environment, then you'll need a fitted pair of insulated gloves. And a glove made to fit in the bureau of a dollhouse will be of no help whatsoever. If you need to sneak into a restaurant in the middle of the night and steal a pair of chopsticks without being discovered, then you'll need a pair, of, a sheer pair of gloves that leave no marks. And a glove decorated with loud bells simply will not do. And if you need to pass unnoticed in a shrubbery-covered landscape, you'll need a very, very large glove made of green and leafy fabric, and an elegant pair of silk gloves will be entirely useless. Nevertheless, the expression fits like a glove simply means that something is very suitable, the way a custard is suitable for dessert or a pair of chopsticks is a suitable tool to remove papers from an open briefcase. And when the Baudelaire orphans put on the uniforms of the Queequeg, they found that they fitted the children like a glove, despite the fact that they did not actually fit that well. Violet was so pleased that the uniforms had several loops around the waist, just perfect for holding tools, that she didn't care that her sleeves bagged at the elbows. Klaus was happy that there was a waterproof pocket for his commonplace book, and didn't care that his boots were a bit too tight. And Sunny was reassured that the shiny material was sturdy enough to resist cooking spills as well as water and didn't mind rolling up the legs of the suit almost all the way so she could walk. But it was more than the individual features of the uniforms that felt fitting. It was the place and the people they represented. For a long time, the Baudelaire's had felt as if their lives were a damaged frisbee, tossed from person to person and from place to place without ever really being appreciated or fitting in. But as they zipped up their uniforms and smoothed out the portraits of Herman Melville, the children felt as if the frisbee of their lives might just be repaired. In wearing the uniform of the Queequeg, the siblings felt a part of something. Not a family, exactly, but a gathering of people who had all volunteered for the same mission. To think that their skills in inventing, research, and cooking would be appreciated was something they had not thought in a long time, and as they stood in the supply room and regarded one another, this feeling fit them like a glove. Shall we go back to the main hall? Violet asked. I'm ready to take a look at the telegram device. Let me just loosen the buckles on these boots, Klaus said, and I'll be ready to tackle those title charts. Queasy, Sunny said. By queasy, she meant something like, I'm looking forward to examining the kitchen. But a loud scraping sound from overhead stopped the youngest Baudelaire from finishing her sentence. The entire submarine seemed to shake, and a few drops of water fell from the ceiling onto the Baudelaire's heads. What was that? Violet asked, picking up a diving helmet. 
Do you think the Queequeg has sprung a leak? I don't know, Klaus said, picking up one helmet for himself and another for Sunny. Let's go find out. The three Baudelaire's hurried back down the corridor to the main hall as the horrid scraping sound continued. If you've ever heard the sound of fingernails against a chalkboard, then you can know how unnerving a scraping sound can be. And to the children, it sounded as if the largest fingernails in the world had mistaken the submarine for a piece of educational equipment. Captain Wittershins? Violet cried over the scraping sound as the Baudelaire's entered the hall. The captain was still at the top of the ladder, grasping the steering wheel in his gloved hand. What's going on? This darned steering mechanism is a disgrace, the captain cried in disgust. I, the Queequeg, just bumped against a rock formation on the side of the stream. If I hadn't managed to get the sub back in control, the submarine Q and its crew of two would be sleeping with the fishes. I. Perhaps I should examine the steering mechanism first, Violet said, and fix the telegram device later. Don't be ridiculous, the captain says. If we can't receive any volunteer factual dispatches, we might as well be wandering around with our eyes closed. We must find the sugar bowl before Count Olaf. Aye, our personal safety isn't nearly as important. Now hurry up. Aye, get a move on. Aye, get cracking. Aye, get a glass of water if you're thirsty. Aye, he or she who hesitates is lost. Violet didn't bother to point out that finding the sugar bowl would be impossible if the submarine was destroyed, but she knew better than to argue with the captain's personal philosophy. It's worth a try, she said, and walked over to the small wheeled platform. Do you mind if I use this? She asked Fiona. It'll help me b get a good look at the device's machinery. Be my guest, Fiona said. Klaus, let's get to work on the title charts. We can study them at the table and keep an eye out for glimpses of the sugar bowl through the porthole. I don't think we'll see it, but it's worth taking a look. Fiona, Violet said hesitantly, could you also take a look for our friend Quigley Quagmire? He was carried away by the stream's other tributary, and we haven't seen him since. Quigley Quagmire, Fiona said, the cartographer. He's a friend of ours, Klaus said. Do you know him? Only by reputation, Fiona said, using a phrase which here means, I don't know him personally, but I've heard of the work he does. The volunteers lost track of him a long time ago, along with Hector and the other Quagmire triplets. The Quagmires haven't been as lucky as we have, Violet said, tying her hair up in a ribbon to help her focus on repairing the telegram device. I'm hoping you'll spot him with the periscope. It's worth a try, Fiona said as Phil walked through the kitchen doors wearing an apron over his uniform. Sunny, he said. I heard you were going to help me in the kitchen. We're a bit low on supplies, I'm afraid. Using the Queequeg nets, I managed to catch a few cod, and we have half a sack of potatoes, but not much else. Do you have any ideas about what to make for dinner? Chowda? Sunny asked. It's worth a try, Phil said, and for the next few hours, all three Baudelaire's tried to see their t if their tasks were worth a try. Violet wheeled herself underneath several pipes to get a good look at the telegram device and frowned as she twisted wires and tightened a few screws with a screwdriver she found lying around. Klaus sat at the table and looked over the title charts using a pencil to trace possible paths the sugar bowl might have taken as the water cycle sent it tumbling down the stricken stream. And Sunny worked with Phil, standing on a large soup pot so she could reach the counter of the small grimy kitchen, boiling potatoes and picking tiny bones out of the cod. And as the afternoon turned to evening and the waters of the stricken stream grew even darker in the porthole, the main hall of the Queequeg was quiet as all the volunteers worked on the tasks at hand. But even when Captain Wittershins climbed down from the ladder, retrieved a small bell from the pocket of his uniform, and filled the room with the echoes of its loud metallic ring, the Baudelaire's could not be certain if all their efforts had been worth a try at all. Attention, the captain said. I, I want the entire crew of the Queequeg to report on their progress. Gather round the table and tell me what's going on. Violet wheeled herself out from under the telegram device and joined her brother and Fiona at the table, while Sunny and Phil emerged from the kitchen. I'll report first, the captain said. I, because I'm the captain. Not because I'm showing off, I. I try not to show off very much. I, because it's rude, I. I've managed to steer us further down the stricken stream without bumping into anything else. I, which is much harder than it sounds. I, we've reached the sea, I. Now it should be easier to not to run into anything. Aye. Violet, what about you? Well, I thoroughly examined the telegram device, Violet said. I made a few minor repairs, but I found nothing that would interfere with receiving a telegram. You're saying that the device isn't broken, aye? The captain demanded. Aye, Violet said, growing more comfortable with the captain's speech. I think there must be a problem on the other end. Procto? Sunny asked, which meant the other end. A telegram requires two devices, Violet said. One to send the message, and the other to receive it. 
I think you haven't been receiving volunteer factual dispatches because whoever sends the messages is having a problem with their machine. But all sorts of volunteers sent us messages, Fiona said. I, the captain said, we've received dispatches from more than 25 agents. Then many machines could be damaged, Violet replied. Sabotage, Klaus said. It does sound like the damage has been done on purpose, Violet agreed. Remember when we sent a telegram to Mr. Poe from the Last Chance General store? Silencio, Sonny said, which meant we never heard a reply. They're closing in, the captain said darkly. Our enemies are preventing us from communicating. I don't see how Count Olaf would have time to destroy all those machines, Klaus said. Many telegrams travel through telephone lines, Fiona said. It wouldn't be difficult. Besides, Olaf isn't the only enemy, Violet said, thinking of two other villains the Baudelaire's had encountered on Mount Fraught. Aye, the captain said, that's for certain. There is evil out there you cannot even imagine. Klaus, have you made any progress on the title charts? Klaus spread out a chart on the table so everyone could see. The chart was really more of a map, showing the stricken stream winding through the mountains before reaching the sea, with tiny arrows and notations describing the way the water was moving. The arrows and notes were in several different colors of ink, as if the chart had been passed from researcher to researcher, each adding notes as he or she discovered more information about the area. It's more complicated than I thought, the middle Baudelaire said, and much more dull. These charts note every single detail concerning the water cycle. Dull, the captain roared. I, we're in the middle of a desperate mission and all you can think of is your own entertainment? I, do you want us to hesitate? Stop our activities and put on a puppet show just so you won't find this submarine dull? You misunderstand me, Klaus said quickly. All I meant was that it's easier to research something that's more interesting. You sound like Fiona, the captain said. When I want her to research the life of Herman Melville, she works slowly, but she's quick as a whip when the subject is mushrooms. Mushrooms? Klaus asked. Are you a mycologist? Fiona smiled, and her eyes grew wide behind her triangular glasses. I never thought I'd meet someone who knew that word, she said. Besides me... Yes, I'm a mycologist. I've been interested in fungi all my life. If we have time, I'll show you my mycological library. Mycological library? Time! Captain Wittershins repeated. We don't have time for fungus books. Aye, we don't have time for you two to do all that flirting either. We're not flirting, Fiona said. We're having a conversation. It looked like flirting to me, the captain said. Aye. Why don't you tell us about your research? Violet said to Klaus, knowing that her brother would rather talk about title charts than his personal life. Klaus gave her a grateful smile and pointed to a point on the chart. If my calculations are correct, he said, the sugar bowl would have been carried down the same tributary we went down in the toboggan. The prevailing currents of the stream lead all the way down here where the sea begins. So it was carried out to sea, Violet said. I think so, Klaus said, and we can see here that the tides would move it away from Sontag shore in a northeasterly direction. Sink? Sunny asked, which meant something like, wouldn't the sugar bowl just drift to the ocean floor? It's too small, Klaus said. Oceans are in constant motion, and an object that falls into the sea could end up miles away. It appears that the tides and currents in this part of the ocean would take the sugar bowl past the Gulag Archipelago here, and then head down toward the mediocre barrier reef before turning at this point here, which is marked AA. Do you know what that is, Captain? It looks like some sort of floating structure. The captain sighed and raised one finger to fiddle with the curl of his mustache. Aye, he said sadly. And Whistle Aquatics. It's a marine research center and a rhetorical advice service. Or it was. It burned down. And Whistle, Violet asked. That was Aunt Josephine's last name. Aye, the captain said. And Whistle Aquatics was founded by Gregor and Whistle, the famous ichnologist and Josephine's brother-in-law. But all that's ancient history. Where did the sugar bowl go next? The Baudelaire's would have preferred to learn more, but knew better than to argue with the captain, and Klaus pointed to a small oval on the chart to continue his report. This is the part that confuses me, he said. You see this oval right next to Anne Whistle Aquatics? It's marked GG, but there's no other explanation. GG, Captain Wittershin said and stroked his mustache thoughtfully. I've never seen an oval like that on a chart like this. There's something else confusing about it, Klaus said, peering at the oval. There are two different arrows inside it, and each one points in a different direction. It looks like the tide is going two ways at once, 
Fiona said. Violet frowned. That doesn't make any sense, she said. I'm confused too, Klaus said. According to my calculations, the sugar bowl was probably carried right to this place on the map. But where it went from there, I can't imagine. I guess we should set a course for GG, whatever that might be, Violet said, and see what we can find when we get there. I'm the captain, the captain cried. I'll give the orders around here. I and I order that we set a course for that oval and see what we can find when we get there. But first I'm hungry and thirsty, I. And my arm itches. I can scratch my own arm, but Cookie and Sunny, you are responsible for food and drink, I. Sunny helped me make a chowder that should be ready in a few minutes, Phil said. Her teeth were very handy in dicing the boiled potatoes. Flosh, Sunny said, which meant don't worry, I cleaned my teeth before using them as kitchen implements. Chowder? Aye, chowder sounds delicious, the captain cried. What about dessert, aye? Dessert's the most important meal of the day. Aye, in my opinion, even though it's not really a meal, aye. Tonight, the only dessert we have is gum, Phil said. I still have some left from my days at the lumber mill. I think I'll pass on dessert. Klaus said, who'd had such a terrible time at Lucky Smell's Lumber Mill, he no longer had a taste for gum. Yomhuldet, Sunny said. She meant, don't worry, Phil and I have arranged a surprise dessert for tomorrow night. But of course, only her siblings could understand the youngest Baudelaire's unusual way of talking. Nevertheless, as soon as Sunny spoke, Captain Wittershin stood up from the table and began crying out in, dis in astonishment. I, he cried, dear God, holy Buddha, Charles Darwin, Duke Ellington, I, Fiona, turn off the engines. I, Cookie, turn off the stove. I, Violet, make sure that telegram device is off. I, Klaus, gather your materials together so nothing rolls around. I, calm down, work quickly, don't panic, help! I, what's going on? Phil asked. What is it, stepfather? Fiona asked. For once, the captain was silent and merely pointed at a screen on the submarine wall. The screen looked like a piece of graph paper lit up in green light with a glowing letter Q in the center. That looks like a sonar detector, Violet said. It is a sonar detector, Fiona said. We can tell if there's any other undersea craft approaching us by detecting the sounds they make. The Q represents the Queequeg and... The mycologist gasped, and the Baudelaire's looked at where she was pointing. At the very top of the panel was another glowing symbol, which was moving down the screen at a fast clip, a phrase which here means straight toward the Queequeg. Fiona did not say what this green symbol stood for, and the children could not bear to ask. It was an eye, staring at the frightened volunteers and wiggling its long, skinny eyelashes which protruded from every side. Olaf, Sunny said in a whisper. There's no way of knowing for sure, Violet, Fiona said, but we'd better follow my stepfather's orders. If it's another submarine, then it has a sonar detector too. If the Queequeg is absolutely silent, they'll have no idea we're here. Oi, the captain said. Hurry, he who hesitates is lost. Nobody bothered to add or she to the captain's personal philosophy, but instead hurried to silence the submarine. Fiona climbed up the rope ladder and turned off the whirring engine. Violet wheeled back into the machinery of the telegram device and turned it off. Phil and Sunny ran into the kitchen to turn off the stove, so even the bubbling of their homemade chowder would not give the Queequeg away. And Klaus and the captain gathered up the materials on the table so nothing would make even the slightest rattle. Within moments, the submarine was silent as the grave, and all the volunteers stood mutely at the table, looking out the porthole into the gloomy water of the sea. As the eye on the sonar screen grew, drew closer to the queue, they could see something emerge from the darkened waters, a strange shape that became clearer as it got closer and closer to the Queequeg. It was indeed another submarine, the likes of which the Baudelaire's had never seen before, even in the strangest of books. It was much, much bigger than the Queequeg, and as it approached, the children had to cover their mouths so their gasps could not be heard. The second submarine was in the shape of a giant octopus, with an enormous metal dome for a head and two wide portholes for eyes. A real octopus, of course, has eight legs, but this submarine had many more. What had appeared to be eyelashes on the sonar screen were really small metal tubes protruding from the body of the octopus and circling in the water, making thousands of bubbles that hurried toward the surface as if they were frightened of the underwater craft. The octopus drew closer and all six passengers on the Queequeg stood as still as statues, hoping the submarine had not discovered them. The strange craft was so close the Baudelaire's could see a shadowy figure inside one of the octopus's eyes. A tall, lean figure, and although the children could not see any further details, they were positive the figure had one eyebrow instead of two, filthy fingernails instead of good grooming habits, and a tattoo of an eye on its left ankle. Count Olaf, 
Sunny whispered before she could stop herself. The figure in the porthole twitched, as if Sunny's tiny noise had caused the Queequeg to be detected. Spouting more bubbles, the octopus drew closer still, and any moment it seemed that one of the legs of the octopus would be heard scraping against the outside of the Queequeg. The three children looked down at their helmets, which they had left on the floor, and wondered if they should put them on, so they might survive if the submarine collapsed. Fiona grabbed her stepfather's arm, but Captain Wittershin shook his head silently and pointed at the sonar screen again. The I and the Q were almost on top of one another on the screen, but that was not what the captain was pointing at. There was a third shape of glowing green light, this one the biggest of all, a huge curved tube with a small circle at the end of it, slithering toward the center of the screen like a snake. But this third underwater craft didn't look like a snake. As it approached the eye and the queue, the small circle leading the enormous curved tube toward the Queequeg and its frightened volunteer crew, the shape looked more like a question mark. The Baudelaire stared at this new third shape approaching them in eerie silence and felt as if they were about to be consumed by the very questions they were trying to answer. Captain Wittershins pointed at the porthole again and the children watched the octopus stop as if it too had detected this strange third shape. Then the legs of the octopus began whirring even more furiously and the strange submarine began to recede from view, a phrase which here means disappear from the porthole as it hurried away from the Queequeg. The Baudelaire's looked at the sonar screen and watched the question mark follow the glowing green eye in silence until both shapes disappeared from the sonar detector and the Queequeg was alone. The six passengers waited a moment and then sighed with relief. It's gone, Violet said. Count Olaf didn't find us. I knew we'd be safe, Phil said, optimistic as usual. Olaf is probably in a good mood anyway. The Baudelaire's did not bother to say that their enemy was only in a good mood when one of his treacherous plans was succeeding, or when the enormous fortune left behind by the Baudelaire parents appeared to be falling into his grubby hands. What was that, stepfather? Fiona said. Why did he leave? What was that third shape? Violet asked. The captain shook his head again. Something very bad, he, told, he said. Even worse than Olaf, probably. I told you, Baudelaire's, that there is evil you cannot even imagine. We don't have to imagine it, Klaus said. We saw it on the screen. That screen is nothing, Captain said. It's just a piece of equipment, I. There was just... There was a philosopher who said that all of life is just shadows. He said that people were just sitting in a cave, watching shadows on the cave wall. Aye. Shadows of something much bigger and grander than themselves. Well, that sonar detector is like our cave wall, showing us the shape of things much more powerful and terrifying. I don't understand... Fiona said. I don't want you to understand, the captain said, putting his arm around her. That's why I haven't told you why the sugar bowl is so very crucial. There are secrets in this world too terrible for young people to know, even as those secrets get closer and closer. Aye, in any case, I'm hungry. Aye, shall we eat? The captain rang his bell again, and the Baudelaire's felt as if they'd awoken from a deep sleep. I'll serve the chowder, Phil said. Come on, Sonny, why don't you help me? I'll turn the engines back on, Fiona said, and began climbing the rope ladder. Violet, there's a drawer in the table full of silverware. Perhaps you and your brother could set the table? Of course, Violet said, but then frowned as she turned to her brother. The middle Baudelaire was staring at the title chart with a look of utter concentration. His eyes were so bright behind his glasses that they looked a bit like the glowing symbols on the sonar detector. Klaus? she asked. Klaus didn't answer his sister, but turned his gaze from the chart to Captain Wittershins. I may not know why that sugar bowl's important, he said, but I just figured out where it is. End of chapter four. <clears throat> I actually don't know if I'll get Animal Crossing. Oh man, E, but if you do, it's fantastic. Oh, bye, Terror. Sorry I didn't see you duck out. Thanks for being here. Puts his glove decorated with loud bells back into the closet. <laughs> Be fun, have safe. Like what Jim Carrey says in Ace Ventura, too. Oh, have a good day, Rock. Oh, hey, CJ. Be safe driving. Paige. All right. Paige. 
so we have one more chapter to read today. I'm at an uh, hour 30. Yeah, these these last three books of the series are definitely going to be longer parts. Because um, splitting it into thirds, I just, I don't know. For some reason, I really like splitting it into thirds. So splitting these bigger books into thirds will mean longer read streams. Hope you're doing well today, CJ. Thanks for being here. Reading this, it just makes me, like more upset that they did not have Captain Wittershins in the show version. Because he's just so great. Okay. Alright. Just trying to re-wet my palette. Okay. Chapter 5. Otherwise it is very similar. You're right. You're right about that. Chapter 5. When you are invited to dine, particularly with people you do not know very well, it is always helpful to have a conversational opener, a phrase which here means an interesting sentence to say out loud in order to get people talking. Although lately it has become more and more difficult to attend dinner parties without the evening ending in gunfire or tapioca, I keep a good list. I keep a list of good and bad conversational openers in my commonplace book in order to avoid awkward pauses at the dinner table. Who would like to see an assortment of photographs taken while I was on vacation, for instance, is a very poor conversational opener because it is likely to make your fellow diners shudder instead of talk. Whereas good conversational openers are sentences such as what would drive a man to commit arson? Why do so many stories of true love end in tragedy and despair? And, Madame de Lustro, I believe I've discovered your true identity, all of which are likely to provoke discussions, arguments, and accusations, thus making the dinner party much more entertaining. When Klaus Bodler announced that he'd discovered the location of the sugar bowl, it was one of the best conversational openers in the history of dinner gatherings, because everyone aboard the Queequeg began talking at once, and dinner had not even been served. I? Captain Wittershins shouted. You figured out what the tide took it? I? But you just said you didn't know. I? You said you were confused by the title charts and that oval marked GG. I? And yet you figured it out. I? You're a genius. I? You're a smarty pants. I? You're a bookworm. I? You're brilliant. I? You're sensational. I? If you find me the sugar bowl, I'll allow you to marry Fiona. Stepfather! Fiona cried, blushing behind her triangular glasses. Don't worry, the captain replied. We'll find a husband for Violet, too. Aye. Perhaps we'll find your long-lost brother, Fiona. He's much older, of course, and he's been missing for years, but if Klaus can locate the sugar bowl, he could probably find him. Aye. He's a charming man, so you'll probably fall in love with him, Violet, and then we could have a double wedding. Aye, right here in the main hall of the Queequeg. Aye, I would be happy to officiate. Aye, I have a bow tie I've been saving for that special occasion. Captain Wittershins, Violet said. Let's try to stick to the subject of the sugar bowl. She did not add that she was not interested in getting married for quite some time, particularly after Count Olaf had tried to marry her in one of his early schemes. Aye, the captain cried. Of course. Naturally. Aye. Tell us everything, Klaus. We'll eat while you talk. Aye. Sunny, cookie, serve the chowder. Chowder is served, announced Phil as he hurried from the kitchen, carrying two steaming bowls of thick soup. The youngest Baudelaire trailed behind him. Sunny was still a bit too young to carry hot food by herself but she had found a pepper grinder and circled the table offering fresh ground pepper to anyone who wanted some. Double pepper for me, Sonny, Captain Wittershins cried, snatching the first bowl of chowder, although it's more polite to let one's guests be served first. A nice hot bowl of chowder, a double helping of pepper, the location of the sugar bowl. Aye, that'll blow the barnacles off me. Aye, I'm so glad I scooped you Baudelaire's out of the stream. I'm glad too, Fiona said, smiling shyly at Klaus. I couldn't be happier about it, Phil said, serving two more bowls of chowder. I thought I'd never see you Baudelaire's again, and here you are. All three of you have grown up so nicely, even though you've been constantly pursued by an evil villain and falsely accused of numerous crimes. You certainly have had a har harrowing journey, Fiona said, using a word which means frantic and extremely depressing. I'm afraid we may have another harrowing journey ahead of us, Klaus said. When Captain Wittershins was talking about the philosopher who said that all of life is just shadows in a cave, I realized at once what that oval must be. A philosopher? The captain asked. That's impossible, I. 
Absurdio, Sunny said, which meant philosophers live at the tops of mountains or in ivory towers, not underneath the sea. I think Klaus means a cave, Violet said quickly rather than translating. The oval must mark the entrance to a cave. It begins right near Anwistle Aquatics, Klaus said, pointing to the chart. The currents of the ocean would have brought the sugar bowl right to the entrance, and then the currents of the cave would have carried it far inside. But the chart only shows the entrance to the cave, Violet said. We don't know what's, what it's like inside. I wish Quigley was here. With his knowledge of maps, he might know the path of the cave. But Quigley isn't here, Klaus said gently. We'll be traveling in uncharted waters. That'll be fun, Phil said. The Baudelaire's looked at one another. The phrase uncharted waters does not only refer to underground locations that do not appear on charts. It's a phrase that can describe any place that is unknown, such as a forest in which every explorer has been lost, or one's own future, which cannot be known until it arrives. You don't have to be an optimist like Phil to find uncharted waters fun. I myself have spent many an enjoyable afternoon exploring the uncharted waters of a book I have not read, or, hiding, or a hiding place I have discovered in a sideboard, a word which here means a piece of furniture in the dining room with shelves and drawers to hold various useful items. But the Baudelaire's had already spent a great deal of time exploring uncharted waters, from the uncharted waters of Lake Lacrimose and its terrifying creatures, to the uncharted waters of secrets found in the Library of Records at Heimlich Hospital, to the uncharted waters of Count Olaf's wickedness, which were deeper and darker than any waters of the sea. After all of their uncharted traveling, the Baudelaire orphans were not in the mood to explore any uncharted waters, and could not share Phil's optimistic enthusiasm. It won't be the first time the Queequeg's been in uncharted waters, Captain Wittershin said. Aye, most of this sea was first explored by VFD submarines. We thought VFD stood for Volunteer Fire Department, Violet said. Why would a fire department spend so much time underwater? VFD isn't just a fire department the captain said, but his voice was very quiet, as if he were talking more to himself than to his crew. Aye, it started that way, but the volunteers were interested in every such thing. I was one of the first to sign up for voluntary fish domestication. That was one of the missions of Anne Whistle Aquatics, aye. I spent four y long years training salmon to swim upstream and search for forest fires. That was when you were very young, Fiona, but your brother worked, worked right alongside me. You should have seen him sneaking extra worms to his favorites. Aye, the program was a modest success. Aye, but then Cafe Salmonella came along and took our entire fleet away. The Snicket siblings fought as best as they could. Aye, historians called it the Snicket Snicker Snee. Aye, but as the post poet wrote, too many waiters turn out to be traitors. The Snicket siblings? Klaus was quick to ask. Aye, the captain said. Three of them each as noble as the next. I, Kit Snicket, helped build this submarine. I, Jacques Snicket, proved that the Royal Garden's fire was arson. I, and the third sibling with the marmosets. You Baudelaire's knew Jacques Snicket, didn't you? Asked Fiona, who wasn't shy about interrupting her stepfather. Very briefly, Violet said, and we recently found a message addressed to him. That's how we found about, uh, that's how we found out about Thursday's gathering at the last safe place. Nobody would write a message to Jacques, Captain Wittershin said. Aye, Jacques is dead. A tartsagam, Sunny said, and her siblings quickly explained that she meant the initials were J.S. It must be some other J.S., Fiona said. Speaking of mysterious initials, Klaus said, I wonder what G.G. stands for. If we knew what the cave was called, we might have a better idea of our journey. Aye, Captain Wittershin said. Let's guess. Uh, Great Glen, aye. Green Glade, aye. Glamorous Glacier, aye. Gleeful Game Room, aye. Glass Goulash, aye. Gothic Government, aye. Um, Grandma's Gingivitis, aye. A girl Getting Up From Table, aye. Indeed, the captain's stepdaughter had stood up, wiped her mouth with a napkin embroidered with a portrait of Herman Melville, and walked over to a sideboard tucked in a far corner. Fiona opened a cabinet and revealed a few shelves stuffed with books. Yesterday, I started reading a new addition to my mycological library, she said, standing on tiptoes to reach the shelf. I just remembered reading something that might come in handy. The captain fingered his mustache in astonishment. You and your mushroom mushrooms and molds, the captain said. I thought I'd never live to see your mycological studies be put to good use, and I'm sorry to say he was right. 
Let's see, Fiona said, paging through a thick book entitled Mushroom Minute, a word which here means obscure facts. It was in the table of contents. That's all I've read so far. It was about halfway through. She brought the book over to the table and ran a finger down the table of contents while the Baudelaire's leaned over to see. Chapter 36, The Yeast of Beasts. Chapter 37, Moral Behavior in a Free Society. Chapter 38, Fungible Mold, Moldable Fungi. Chapter 39, Visitable Fungal Ditches. Chapter 40, Chapter 40, The Gregornian Grotto. There. Grotto? Sunny asked. Grotto is another word for cave, Klaus explained as Fiona flipped ahead to chapter 40. The Gregornian Grotto, she read, located in propinquity to Anwissal Aquatics, has appropriately wraith-like nomenclature, with roots in Grecian mythology as this conical cavern is f f fecund with what is perhaps the bugaboo of the entire mycological pantheon. Why, I told you that book was too difficult, Captain Wh Wittershin said. A young child can't unlock that sort of vocabulary. It's a very complicated prose style, Klaus admitted, but I think I know what it says. The Gregorian, Gregorian Grotto was named after something in Gr Greek mythology. A gorgon, Violet said, like that woman with snakes instead of hair. She could turn people into stone, Fiona said. She was probably nice when you got to know her, Phil said. I, I think I went to school with such a woman, the captain said. I don't think she was a real per person, Klaus said. I think she was legendary. The book says it's appropriate that the grotto is named after a legendary monster because there's a sort of monster living in a cave. A bugaboo. Bugaboo? Sunny asked. A bugaboo can be any kind of monster, Klaus said. We could call Count Olaf a bugaboo if we felt so inclined. I'd rather not speak of him at all, Violet said. This bugaboo is a fungus of some sort, Fiona said, and continued reading from Mushroom Minute. The medusoid mycelium has a unique conducive conducive strategy of waxing and waning. First, a brief dormant cycle in which the mycelium is nearly invisible, and then a precipitated flowering into speckled stalks and caps of such intense venom that it is fortunate the grotto serves as a quarantine. I didn't understand all of that scientific terminology, Klaus admitted. I did, Fiona said. There are three main parts to a mushroom. One is the cap, which is shaped like an umbrella, and the second is the stalk, which holds the umbrella up. Those are the pots you can see. There's a part of the mushroom you can't see? Violet asked. It's called the mycelium, Fiona replied. It's like a bunch of thread, branching out underneath the ground. Some mushrooms have mycelia that go on for miles. How do you spell mycelium? Klaus asked, reaching into his waterproof pocket. I want to write this word down in my commonplace book. Fiona pointed the word out on the page. The medusoid mycelium waxes and wanes, she said, which meant means that the caps and stalks spring up from the mycelium and then wither away and then spring up again. It sounds like you wouldn't know the mushrooms are there until they poke out of the ground. The Baudelaire's pictured a group of mushrooms suddenly springing up under their feet and felt a bit queasy as if they already knew of the, the dreadful encounter that they would soon have with this terrible fungus. That sounds unnerving, Violet said. It gets worse, Fiona said. The mushrooms are exceedingly poisonous. Listen to this. As the poet says, a single spore has such grim power that you may die within the hour. A spore is like a seed. If it has a place to grow, it will become another mycelium. But if someone eats it or even breathes it in, it can cause death. Within the hour? Klaus said. That's a fast-acting poison. Most fungal poisons have cures, Fiona said. The poison of a deadly fungus can be the source of some wonderful medicines. I've been working on a few myself, but this book says it's lucky the grotto acts as a quarantine. Quora? Sunny asked. Quarantine is when something dangerous is isolated so the danger cannot spread, Klaus explained. Because the medusoid mycelium is in uncharted waters, very few people have been poisoned. If someone brought even one spore to dry land, who knows what would happen? We won't find out, Captain Wittershin says. We're not going to take any spores. I, we're just going to grab the sugar bowl and be on our way. Aye, I'll set a course right now. The captain bounded up from the table and began climbing the rope ladder to the Queequeg's controls. Are you sure we could continue our mission? Fiona asked for her, asked her stepfather, shutting the book. It sounds very dangerous. Dangerous? Aye, dangerous and scary. Aye, scary and difficult. 
I, difficult and mysterious. I, mysterious and uncomfortable. I, uncomfortable and risky. I, risky and noble. I. I suppose the fungus can't hurt us if we're inside the submarine, Phil said, struggling to remain optimistic. Even if it could, the captain cried, standing at the top of the rope ladder and gesturing dramatically as he delivered an impassioned oratory, a phrase which here means emotional speech that the Baudelaire's found utterly convincing, even if they did not agree with every word. The amount of treachery in this world is enormous, he cried. I think of the crafts we saw on the sonar screen. Think of Count Olaf's enormous submarine and the even more enormous one that chased it away. Aye, there's always something more enormous and more terrifying on our tails. Aye, and so many of the noble submarines are gone. Aye, you think the Herman Melville suits are the only noble uniforms in this world? There used to be volunteers with P.G. Wodehouse on their uniforms and Carl Van Vechten. There was Commons and Cleary and Arky and Mahidabel. But now volunteers are scarce. So the best we can do is one small noble thing. Aye, like retrieving the sugar bowl from the Gorgonian Grotto no matter how grim it sounds. I remember my personal philosophy. He who hesitates is lost. Or she, Fiona said. Or she, the captain agreed. I? I, Violet cried. I, Klaus shouted. I, Sunny shrieked. Hooray, Phil yelled. Captain Wittershins peered down in annoyance at Phil, who would have, whom he would have preferred say I along with everyone else. Cookie, he ordered. Do the dishes. The rest of you, get some shut-eye. I. I. Shut I? Violet asked. I, it means sleep, the captain explained. We know what it means, Klaus said. We're just surprised we're supposed to sleep through this mission. It'll take some time to get to the cave, the captain said. I want you four to be well rested in case you're needed. Now go to your barracks, I. It is one of life's bitterest truths that bedtime so often arrives just when things are really getting interesting. The Baudelaire's were not particularly in the mood to toss and turn in the Queequeg's barracks, a word which here means a type of bedroom that is usually uncomfortable. As the submarine drew closer and closer to the mysterious grotto and its indispensable item, a phrase which here means the sugar bowl, although the children did not know why it was so important. But as they followed Fiona out of the main hall and back down the corridor, past the plaque advertising the captain's personal philosophy, the door to the supply room, and an uncountable number of leaky metal pipes, the siblings felt quite tired, and by the time Fiona opened a door to reveal a small, green-lit room stacked with saggy bunk beds, the three children were already yawning. Perhaps it was because of their long, exhausting day which had begun on the icy summit of Mount Fraught, but Violet didn't ponder one single mechanical idea as she got into bed, as she usually did before she went to sleep. Klaus scarcely had time to put his glasses on a small bedside table before he nodded off, a phrase which here means fell asleep without considering even one of the books he'd recently read. Sunny curled up on a pillow and she didn't waste one moment dreaming up new recipes, preferably entrees that were less mushy than chowder, as she still enjoyed biting things as much as she did when she was a baby, before she was dreaming herself. And even Fiona, whose bedtime habits were are less familiar to me than that of the Baudelaire's, put her glasses next to Klaus's and was asleep in moments. The whirring engine of the Queequeg sent them deeper and deeper into slumber for several hours, and they probably would have slept much longer if the children hadn't been awakened by a terrible, and terribly familiar, noise. It was a loud, unnerving scraping like fingernails against a chalkboard, and the Baudelaire's were almost shaken out of bed as the entire submarine rattled. What was that? Violet asked. We hit something, Fiona said grimly, grabbing her glasses in one hand and her diving helmet in the other. We better see what the situation is. The Baudelaire's nodded in agreement and hurried out of the barracks and back down the corridor. There was an unnerving splashing sound coming from a few of the tubes, and Klaus had to pick up Sunny to carry her over several large puddles. Is the submarine collapsing? Klaus asked. We'll know soon enough, Fiona said, and she was correct. In moments, she led the Baudelaire's back into the main hall, where Phil and the captain were standing at the table, staring out the porthole into black nothingness. They each had grim expressions on their faces, although Phil was trying to smile at the same time. It's good, it's good you got some rest, the optimist said. There's a real adventure ahead of you. I'm glad you brought your diving helmets, Captain Wittershin said. Aye. Why, Violet asked, is the Queequeg seriously damaged? Aye, the captain said. I mean, no, the submarine is damaged, but she'll hold for now. 
We've reached the Gorgonian Grotto about an hour ago, and I was able to steer us inside with no problem. But the cave got narrower and narrower and we, as we maneuvered, maneuvered further and further inside. The book said the grotto was canonical. Was conical. Klaus said, that means it's shaped like a cone. Aye, the captain said. The entrance was the wide end of the cone, but now it's too narrow for the submarine to travel. If we want to retrieve the sugar bowl, we'll have to use something smaller. Periscope, Sunny asked. No, Captain Wittershins replied. A child. It's the end of chapter five. Snicket Snickersnee, that's what it said. The nicest if she doesn't turn you into stone. Aye, uh, aye, aye. Aye, sugar hot, aye. Hi, little bro. That is all I'm gonna read for today. I've been going for almost two hours. That was the end of chapter five, so we have, I'm trying to do math, there's 13 chapters in this sucker. We've read five, so there are eight chapters left. It's missing an I. Actually, I am. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Um, my shoulder's starting to disappear. Um, I will be reading some more of this probably next week, so look forward to that. Um, I am actually going to stream, I think, tomorrow morning, because uh, I don't have jury duty tomorrow. I don't have to go back until Wednesday, so I think I'm going to stream tomorrow morning, probably about 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, as my usual morning streams tend to go. Uh, so hopefully I'll see you guys then. Um, if not, please take care of yourselves. Um, until I see you again, much love from me to you. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank you for being here. See y'all shortly. Bye.